Chapter 16 of The Lion of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 16 The Recapture of the Pluto. As soon as the hatch had been removed and the bread and water lowered down, and they heard heavy weights again laid on the hatch two of the party took one of the irons and began to bore a hole while the others proceeded to eat their food several times the workers had to be relieved the iron penetrated comparatively easily for a short distance but beyond that the difficulty greatly increased and it was fully four hours before one of the workers applying his eye to the hole said that he could see a gleam of light through in another quarter of an hour, the orifice was sufficiently enlarged to enable a view to be obtained of the central hold. It was comparatively light there, for the hatch was off, and they could see two men at work, opening a cask for some stores that were required. "'We must wait till it gets dark now,' Francis said. "'I do not think that we shall make much noise, for the nails will be likely to draw quietly, but we had better choose the time between nightfall and the hour for the crew to turn in, as there will be a trampling of feet on deck, and talking and singing, which would prevent any slight noise we might make being heard. The difficulty will be to force the ends of the iron down between the beams and the planks, so as to give us a purchase, Matteo said. I think we shall be able to manage that, Francis replied. The beams are put in in the rough, and if we hunt carefully, I think we shall find a plank where we can get the irons in far enough between it and the beam to give us a hold. After a careful examination, they fixed upon a plank to operate upon, and, leaving one of the irons there, so that they could find it in the dark, they lay down to sleep or sat talking until it was dark. Before this, a glance through the peephole showed them that the hatch had been placed over the hatchway of the next hold, so that there was little fear of any one coming down unless something special was required now i think we can begin francis said at last do you paolo parucchi take one of the irons i will take another matteo a third we cannot possibly work more than three at the foot of a plank though perhaps when we have fixed them and put on the strain two or three more hands may get at the irons but first we will try with three and unless the nails have got a wonderfully firm hold, we shall certainly be able to draw them. It took some time to fix the irons to the best advantage between the planks and the beam. Are you both ready? Francis asked at last. Then pull! As Francis had anticipated, the levers did their work, and the nails yielded a little. It has sprung half an inch, Francis said, feeling. Now you keep your irons as they are, well, I thrust mine down farther. I have got a fresh hold. Do you shift yours? Again the effort was made, and this time the nails drew fully two inches. Another effort and the plank was completely free at the lower end. Now, do you push against it as hard as you can, Francis said, while I get my iron in between it and the beam above. The upper nails yielded even more easily than those below no farther francis said when they had fairly started them or the plank will be falling with a crash we must push from the bottom now until it gives sufficiently far for you to get an iron down each side to prevent its closing again now he said push the irons higher up that's right now i will loosen a bit farther at the top and then you will be able to get your hands in at the bottom to steady it and prevent its falling when the nails are quite drawn Another effort, and the plank was free, and, being drawn in, was laid down. The delight of those who were standing in the dark, and could only judge how matters were going on from Francis's low-spoken orders, was extreme. Can we get through? No, Francis replied. It will be necessary to remove another plank first, but perhaps one of the slighter among you might manage to squeeze through and hold the plank at the back. We shall be able to work with more freedom if we know that there is no danger of its falling. In a few minutes, the second plank was laid beside the first. 
what is to be done next matteo asked we must establish a communication with the sailors i will take a working party of four paolo parucchi with four others will relieve me you matteo will with the rest take the last spell when we have entered the next compartment we will put up the planks again and press the nails in tightly enough to prevent their falling should by some chance any one descend into the hold while we are working we shall be hidden from their view at the other end there are a number of sacks piled up and we shall be working behind them francis and the men he had chosen made their way to the pile of arms they had observed through their peephole moving with great precaution so as to avoid falling over anything here with some trouble they succeeded in finding a dagger among the heap and they then felt their way on until they reached the pile of sacks these were packed to within a foot of the deck beams and there was but just room for them to crawl in at the top whatever you do do not bump against the beams francis said any noise of that sort from below would at once excite attention now do you be quiet while i find a spot to begin upon commencing at a junction of two planks francis began with the dagger to cut a hole of some three or four inches across but tapering rapidly as it went in after waiting for some ten minutes he touched the man lying next to him placed his hand on the hole he had begun and then moved aside to allow him to continue the work in an hour a hole was made in a two-inch plank and this was soon enlarged until it was an inch in diameter lying along the side of the bulkhead so as to get his ear to the hole francis listened but could hear no sound within then he put his mouth to the orifice and asked are you all asleep there then he listened again some of the men were speaking and asking each other who it was that had suddenly spoken no one replied and some of them gave vent to angry threats against whoever it might be who had just disturbed them from going off to sleep directly the voices ceased again francis said let us have silence in there where is rinaldo the boatswain i am here a voice replied but who is speaking it sounds like the voice of messer hammond it is my voice rinaldo we have worked through from the hold at the other end of the ship having removed some of the planks of the bulkhead now it is for you to do the same we will pass you some daggers through when we have made this hole a bit larger you must choose one of the planks in the corner as this will be less likely to be observed they will not observe us messer hammond they never come down here at all but pass our food down in buckets nevertheless begin at the plank next to the side francis said possibly someone may come down before you have finished you will have to remove two planks to get through i will pass a javelin through you can set to work with it and bore holes through the plank close to the floor and then with the dagger cut away the wood between them when you have done them set two at the top close to the beams and cut the two planks through there there are sacks of grain piled up against them on this side so that there is no fear of your being observed from here the work must be carried on perfectly noiselessly the men relieving each other every few minutes when the planks are cut through replace them in their former positions and wedge some small pieces of wood in so that there shall be no chance of their falling you ought to finish the work by tomorrow when you have done it take no farther step until you get orders from me it would not do to rise now for we may be surrounded by other ships and if we overpowered the crew we should at once be attacked and recaptured by them you will therefore remain quiet until you have orders whether it be one day or ten all the arms they have taken from us are lying piled here and when the time comes we shall have no difficulty in overpowering the genoese and shall i hope bring the pluto safely to anchor in the port of venice before long there was a murmur of delight among the sailors pent up in their close quarters francis listened a moment and heard one of the men say what did i tell you didn't i tell you that messer hammond got us all out of a scrape before 
when our ship was captured by the Genoese, and that I would be bound he would do the same again, if he had but the shadow of a chance? You did, Pietro, and you have turned out right. That is the sort of fellow to have for a captain. He is not like one of those dainty young nobles who don't know one rope's end from another, and who turn up their noses at the thought of dirtying their hands. See how he looked after us through the winter. I wish we could give a cheer for him, but that would never do. But when we are out of this, I will give him the loudest shout I ever gave yet. Now then, Rinaldo, let us set to work, without a moment's delay. There's a chance we aren't going to rot in the dungeons of Genoa after all. Convinced that the work would be carried on in accordance with his orders, Francis withdrew his ear from the hole, and crawling over the sacks again, made his way to the pile of arms, felt about until he found two javelins, and, taking these back, passed them one after the other through the hole. "'We have done our share now,' he said to his comrades. Paolo and his party will find it a comparatively easy task to enlarge the hole sufficiently to pass the daggers through. The party returned to the other end of the hold, removed the planks, and joined their friends. The next watch had arranged to lie down close to the planks, so that they could be aroused without waking the others. They were soon on their feet. Francis explained to Parucchi the progress they had made, and the orders that had been given to the sailors as to what they were to do. When the hole is large enough, pass these five daggers in to the crew, and then come back again. I will guide you to the spot, and on my return will pick out half a dozen more daggers, in case we want them for further work. When daylight made its way into the hold, Matteo and his watch woke, and were astonished to find that all their comrades were quietly asleep, and that they had not been awakened. Matteo could not restrain his curiosity, but woke Francis. Has anything gone wrong, Francis? It is daylight, and Parucchi's party, as well as yours, are all asleep, while we have not been roused. Everything is going on well, Matteo, and we did not wake you because there was nothing for you to do. We have already passed in knives and javelins to the sailors, and they are at work cutting through two planks in their bulkhead after which we shall be able to meet in the next hold, arm ourselves, and fall upon the Genoese when the opportunity offers. That is excellent indeed, Francis, but I wish you had let us do our share of the work. It did not take us more than two hours, Matteo, to make a hole big enough to pass the javelins through, and I should say Parucchi's party enlarged it sufficiently to hand in the daggers in another hour. So you see, it would have been useless to have aroused you, and the less movement we make after they get quiet at night, the better. And how long will the sailors be cutting it through, do you think? I should say they would be ready by this time, Matteo, but certainly they will be finished some time today. Then we shall soon be free, Matteo exclaimed joyfully. That will depend, Matteo. We must wait till there is a good opportunity so that we can recapture the ship without an alarm being given to the other vessels, which are no doubt sailing in company with us. And now, if you have nothing to say, I will go off to sleep again, for there is time for another hour or two. I feel as if I had not quite finished my night's rest, and the days pass so slowly here that it is as well for us to sleep when we feel the least inclination. By the way, Matteo, put something into that peephole we made, it is possible that they might see the light through it and come to examine what it is. It is better to run no risk. That day the captives were far more restless than they had been since they were taken prisoners. At first there had been a feeling of depression, too great to admit even of conversation with each other. The defeat of their fleet, the danger that threatened Venice, and the prospect of imprisonment in the gloomy dungeons of Genoa, combined to depress them on the first day of their imprisonment. On the second, their success in getting out the bolts had cheered them, and they had something to look forward to and talk about. But still, few of them thought that there was any real prospect of their obtaining their freedom. Now, however, that success seemed to lie ready to hand. Now that they could, that very evening, remove the sacks, effect a junction with their crew, arm themselves with the weapons lying in sight, and rush up and overpower the Genoese. 
it seemed hard to remain longer in confinement several of them urged francis to make the attempt that night but he refused you reckon only on the foe you see he said the danger lies not from them but from the foes we cannot see we must wait for an opportunity but no opportunity may occur one of them urged well, that is quite possible francis agreed but should no special opportunity occur we shall be none the worse for having waited for it will always be as open to us to make the attempt as it is to-night it might succeed possibly we could overpower the guard on deck before they could give the alarm but the risk is too great to be run until we are certain that no other way is open to us in the daylight the hatch is open but even could we free our comrades and unite for a rush unobserved which we could hardly hope to do we should find the whole of the genoese on deck and could not possibly overpower them before they had time to give the alarm to other vessels at night when we can unite we cannot gain the deck for the hatch is not only closed but would almost certainly be fastened so that men should not get down to pilfer among the stores but if we cannot attack in the daytime messer hammond without giving the alarm and cannot attack at all at night what are we to do well, that is the next point to be seen to francis replied we must cut either from this hold or from the other away up to the deck above it may take us some days to do this but that matters little we have plenty of time for the work before reaching genoa the difficulty is not in the work itself but in doing it unobserved that is difficult indeed matteo said seeing that the genoese sailors are quartered in the forecastle above the forehold while the officers will be in the cabins in the poop over us that is so matteo and for that reason it is clear that it is we not the sailors who must cut through the planks above there are no divisions in the forecastle and it will be therefore absolutely impossible to cut through into it without being perceived long before a hole is made of a sufficient size to enable us to get out here we may succeed better for fortunately we know of the exact plan of the cabins above us and can choose a spot where we should not be likely to be noticed that is so matteo agreed and as they will not have as many officers as we had that is including the volunteers some of the cabins will not be occupied perhaps by listening to the footsteps above we might find out which are vacant i thought of that matteo but i doubt whether it would be well to rely upon that many on board ship wear soft shoes which make but little noise and it would be fatal to us were we to make a mistake after thinking it over i have decided that we had best try to cut away up into the captain's cabin but that is sure to be occupied messer hammond paruki said yes it will certainly be occupied but it affords a good opportunity of success as you know paruki carlo bottini had been a long time at constantinople and the eastern ports and had a somewhat luxurious taste do you not remember that against the stern windows he had caused to be erected a low wide seat running across the cabin this he called a divan and spent no small proportion of his time lolling upon it if i am right its height was from ten inches to a foot above the deck and it was fully four feet wide it would therefore be quite possible to cut through the two planks at the back without its being observed by anyone in the cabin there was a chorus of assent of course we must work most cautiously francis went on the wood must be cut out with clean cuts with the daggers there must be no sawing or scraping the beams are two feet apart and we must cut through two planks close to them in that way there will be no nails to remove of course we shall not cut quite through until the time arrives for us to make the attempt but just leave enough to hold the planks together half an hour's work will get through that for if we were to cut through it at once not only would there be risk of the hole being discovered by anyone sweeping the cabin but we should be obliged to remain absolutely silent or we should be heard immediately we can begin at once can we not matteo asked 
anything is better than sitting quietly here certainly matteo if you wish two can work at once one on each line choose the two sharpest edged of the daggers and be sure to cut clean and not to make a scraping noise or to try to break out pieces of wood the work must be done in absolute quiet indeed however careful you are it is possible that some slight sound may be heard above but if noticed it will probably be taken for the rats matteo and another of the young men at once fell to work but it was not until the evening of the following day that cuts were made as deep as was considered prudent the depth of wood remaining was tested by thrusting the point of a dagger through and it was decided that little more than a quarter of an inch remained upon the following day the ship anchored and remained for two days in some port provisions were brought on board and carried down into the hold and the prisoners had no doubt that they were in harbour on the coast of either sicily or the south of italy they had not set sail many hours when the motion of the ship told them that the wind was getting up and by night the vessel was rolling heavily the noise made by the dashing of the water against her planks being so great that those below could scarcely hear each other speak their spirits had risen with the increase of the motion for the opportunity for which they had been waiting was now at hand in a gale the vessels would keep well apart from each other to prevent the danger of a collision and any outcry would be drowned by the noise of the wind and water each night francis had paid a visit to the sailors forward to enjoin patience until he should give them the order for making the attempt they had long since cut through the planks which were only retained in their place by the pressure of the sacks behind them he had bade them be in readiness on the first occasion on which rough weather might set in and knew that they would now be expecting the signal as soon then as it became dark and the hatch over the middle hold was closed the planks were removed and francis and his party set to work shifting the sacks in the corner where the sailors had cut the planks each sack was taken up and placed against the pile further on without the slightest noise until at last all were removed that stood in the way of the planks being taken down these were carried out into the hold francis entered the gap the sailors had already been informed that the occasion had come and that they were to remain perfectly quiet until bidden to move all is prepared he said as he entered rinaldo do you see that the men come out one by one as each comes out a weapon will be placed in his hands and he will then be led to the starboard side of the hold which is free from encumbrance and will there stand until he receives orders to move further remember that not the slightest noise must be made for if any stumbled and fell and the noise were heard above it might be thought that some of the stores had shifted from their places and men would be sent below to secure them the alarm would be given and a light or other signal shown the other ships before we could overpower all resistance after the men are all ranged up as i have directed they will have to remain there for some little time while we complete our arrangements as soon as the sailors were all armed and ready for action francis entered the afterhold where matteo and another had been engaged in cutting the planks quite through they had just completed the task when he reached them and had quietly removed the two pieces of plank francis had already given his orders to his companions and each knew the order in which they were to ascend a dim light streamed down from the hole two of his comrades lifted francis so that his head was above the level of the hole and he was enabled to see into the cabin so far as he could tell it was untenanted but it was possible that the commander might be on the divan above him this was not however likely as in the gale that was now blowing he would probably be on deck directing the working of the ship francis now gave the signal and the others raised him still further until he was able to get his weight upon the deck above and he then crawled along underneath the divan and lay there quiet until parucchi and matteo had both reached the deck then he gave the word and all three rolled out and leaped to their feet with their daggers in their hands 
in readiness to fall upon the captain should he be on the divan as they had hoped and expected the cabin was untenanted the other volunteers now joined them the last giving the word to rinaldo who soon passed up followed by the crew until the cabin was as full as it could contain there were now assembled some fifty men closely packed together that is ample francis said as they will be unarmed and unprepared we can issue out singly until the alarm is given and then those that remain must rush out in a body simply knock them down with the hilts of your swords there is no occasion to shed blood unless in the case of armed resistance but remember they will have their knives in their girdles and do not let anyone take you by surprise opening the door francis walked along a passage and then through an outer door into the waist of the ship the wind was blowing fiercely but the gale was not so violent as it had appeared to them when confined below the night was dark but after a week's confinement below his eyes were able easily to make out almost every object on deck there were but few sailors in the waist the officers would be on the poop and such of the crew as were not required on duty in the forecastle man after man joined him until some thirty were gathered near the bulwarks an officer on the poop caught sight of them by the light of the lantern which was suspended there as a signal to the other vessels what are all you men doing down there he challenged there is no occasion for you to keep on deck until you are summoned do you move forward with the men here paruki knock down the fellows on deck and rush into the forecastle and overpower them there before they can get up their arms i will summon the rest in a body and we will overpower the officers he ran back to the cabin door and bade the men follow him as they poured out there was a scuffle on the deck forward and the officer shouted out again what is going on there what does all this mean francis sprang up the ladder to the poop followed by his men and before the officer standing there understood the meaning of this sudden rush of men or had time to draw his sword he was knocked down the captain and three other officers who were standing by the helm drew their swords and rushed forward thinking there was a mutiny among their crew but francis shouted out throw down your weapons all of you we have retaken the ship and resistance is useless and will only cost you your lives the officers stood stupefied with astonishment and then seeing that fully twenty armed men were opposed to them they threw down their swords francis ordered four of the sailors to conduct them to the captain's cabin and remain in guard over them then with the rest he hurried forward to assist parucchi's party but the work was already done the genoese taken completely by surprise had at once surrendered as the armed party rushed in the forecastle and the ship was already theirs as soon as the prisoners were secured the after hatch was thrown off and those whose turn to crawl up through the hole had not yet arrived came up on deck rinaldo francis said as soon as the crew had fallen into their places send a man aloft and let him suddenly knock out the light in the lantern but we can lower it down captain from the deck of course we can rinaldo but i don't want it lowered down i want it put suddenly out rinaldo at once sent a man up and a minute later the light suddenly disappeared if we were seen to lower it down francis said to matteo the suspicions of those who noticed it would be at once aroused for the only motive for doing so would be concealment whereas now if it is missed it will be supposed that the wind has blown it out now we have only to lower our sails and we can drop unobserved out of the fleet there are sixteen lights i have just been counting them matteo said these are probably the fourteen galleys captured with us and two galleys as guards in case on their way they should fall in with any of our ships Paruki, will you at once muster the men and see that all are armed and in readiness for fighting matteo do you and some of your friends assist the lieutenant in a few minutes Paruki reported that the men were all ready for action. Rinaldo, 
brail up the sails so that we may drop into the rear of the squadron watch the lights of the vessels behind and steer so that they shall pass us as widely as possible this was the order the men were expecting to receive but they were surprised when just as the last light was abreast of them francis gave the order for the brails to be loosed again signor parucchi do you tell off fifty men i am going to lay the ship alongside that vessel and recapture her they will not see us until we are close on board and will suppose it is an accident when we run alongside no doubt they like the pluto have only a complement of fifty men and we shall overpower them before they are prepared to offer any resistance no doubt they have prisoners below immediately we have recaptured her i shall return on board with the rest leaving you with your fifty men in charge of her as soon as you have secured the genoese free any prisoners there may be in the hold i shall keep close to you and you can hear me and tell me how many there are the pluto was now edged away till she was close to the other ship the crew exulting in having turned the tables on the genoese and at the prospect of recovering another of the lost galleys clustered in the waist grasping their arms the ship was not perceived until she was within her own length of the other then there was a sudden hail where are you coming to keep away or you'll be into us why don't you show your light francis shouted back some indistinct answer rinaldo pushed down the helm and a minute later the pluto ran alongside the other vessel half a dozen hands told off for the work sprang into her rigging and lashed the vessels together while francis followed by the crew climbed the bulwarks and sprang on to the deck of the enemy scarce a blow was struck the genoese astonished at this sudden apparition of armed men on their deck and being entirely unarmed and unprepared either ran down below or shouted they surrendered and in two minutes the venetians were masters of the vessel back to the pluto francis shouted the vessels will tear their sides out almost as suddenly as they had invaded the decks of the galley the venetians regained their own vessel leaving the lieutenant with his fifty men on board the prize the lashings were cut the pluto's helm put up and she sheered away from her prize her bulwarks were broken and splintered where she had ground against the other vessel in the sea and rinaldo soon reported that some of the seams had opened and the water was coming in set the carpenter and some of the hands to work to caulk the seams as well as they can from the inside and set a gang to work at the pumps at once it is unfortunate that it is blowing so hard if the wind had gone down instead of rising we would have recaptured the whole fleet one by one the pluto was kept within a short distance of the captured vessel and parucchi presently shouted out that he had freed two hundred prisoners arm them at once francis shouted back extinguish your light and board the vessel whose light you see on your starboard bow i will take the one to port when you have captured her lower the sails of both vessels i will do the same you will keep a little head sail set so as to keep them before the wind but do not show more than you can help i wish the rest of the fleet to outrun us as soon as possible the pluto sheered off from the prize and directed her course towards the vessel nearest to her which she captured as easily as she had done the preceding but this time not only were her bulwarks stove in but the chain plates were carried away and the mainmast no longer supported by its shrouds fell over the side with a crash this vessel had but a hundred prisoners on board they were wild with astonishment and delight when they found that their vessel had been recaptured francis told them to keep by him through the night as possibly he might need their assistance for some hours the gale increased the pluto lay head to it her mast serving as a floating anchor as soon as the lights of the genoese squadron disappeared in the distance francis hoisted a lantern on his main mast as a signal to the other vessels to keep near him as soon as day broke the galley they had last recaptured was seen half a mile away while the two others could be made out some six miles to leeward 
the gale died out soon after daybreak and francis at once set his crew to work to get the mast on board and to ship it by its stump it was a difficult undertaking for the vessel was rolling heavily it was first got alongside two ropes were passed over it and it was parbuckled on board shears were made of two spars and the end was placed against the stump which projected six feet above the deck by the aid of the shears it was hoisted erect and lashed to the stump wedges were driven in to tighten the lashings and it was then firmly stayed and by the afternoon it was in readiness for sail to be hoisted again by this time paruki with the vessel he had captured was alongside the lion of st mark was hoisted to the mainmast of the pluto and three similar banners were run up by the other vessels the crews shouting and cheering with wild enthusiasm end of chapter sixteen recording by linda johnson chapter seventeen of the lion of st mark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the lion of st mark a story of venice in the fourteenth century by g a henty chapter seventeen an ungrateful republic it is glorious francis matteo said to think that we should have recaptured four of our ships it is very good as far as it goes francis replied but it might have been a great deal better if it hadn't been for the storm we might have picked them all up one by one each vessel we took the stronger we became and i had calculated upon our capturing the greater number but in such a sea i don't think we could possibly capture more than we did i should think not matteo said i had never dreamt of doing more than recovering the pluto and when you first talked about that it seemed almost like madness i don't think one of us had the slightest belief in the possibility of the thing when you first proposed it i thought it was to be managed somehow francis said it would have been a shame indeed if a hundred and fifty men were to be kept prisoners for a fortnight or three weeks by a third of their number Well certainly no one would have thought of making the attempt if you had not proposed it francis i believe even if you were to propose our sailing north and capturing genoa there is not a man on board but would follow you willingly with the firm conviction that you would succeed in that case matteo francis said laughing it is very lucky for you that i am not at all out of my mind signal now to paruki to lower his boats and come on board with our men we may fall in yet with another genoese squadron and may as well have our full complement on board especially as paruki has found two hundred men already on board the vessel we captured paruki and his men soon transferred themselves to the pluto and the four vessels hoisted their sails and made for the south they had learned from their captives that the squadron had already passed through the straits of messina and that it was at messina they had stopped and taken in provision two days before indeed when late in the afternoon the sky cleared and the sun shone out they saw the mountains of calabria on their left learning from the captives that no genoese vessels had been seen in the straits as they passed through francis did not hesitate to order the course to be shaped for the straits instead of sailing round sicily as he would have done had there been any chance of falling in with a hostile squadron in passing between the islands and the mainland i should like to have seen the face of the commander of the genoese squadron this morning matteo said when he discovered that four of his vessels were missing he can hardly have supposed that they were lost for although the wind was strong it blew nearly dead aft and there was nothing of a gale to endanger well-handled ships i almost wonder that he did not send back the two fully manned galleys he had with him to search for us perhaps he did francis said but he would have been a hundred miles further north by daybreak and it would have taken him a couple of days to get back to where we were lying no hostile sail was seen during the voyage back to venice francis remained in command of the little squadron 
for the captains and many of the superior officers had been transferred to the galley of the officer in command of the squadron and francis happened to be the only second officer on board any of the four ships great care was observed when they approached venice as for aught they knew doria's squadron might be blockading the port the genoese fleet however was still cruising on the coast of dalmatia capturing port after port of the venetian possessions there the four vessels passed through the channel of the lido with their colors flying when first observed from the watch-tower of venice they were supposed to form part of the squadron of zeno but as soon as they cast anchor and the news spread that they were four of pisani's galleys which had been recaptured from the genoese the delight of the population was immense the ships were speedily surrounded by a fleet of boats containing relatives and friends of those taken prisoners at the battle of polo and the decks were crowded with persons inquiring after their friends or embracing with delight those whom they had an hour before believed to be either dead or immured in the dungeons of genoa one of the first to appear was polani who had early received the news by a swift boat from one of his ships in the port that the pluto was one of the vessels entering the harbor what miracle is this francis he asked as he warmly embraced his young friend not a miracle at all messer polani the genoese fancied that a guard of fifty men was amply sufficient to keep a hundred and fifty venetians captives and we taught them their mistake it wasn't we matteo put in as he shook hands with his kinsman we had no more idea of escaping than we had of flying the whole thing was entirely the work of francisco here i might have been sure the genoese would not keep you long francisco polani said and the girls and i might have spared ourselves the pain of fretting for you but how did it all come about if you will take me to the piazza in your gondola i will tell you all about on the way francis replied for absurd as it seems i am the senior officer of the squadron and must i suppose report to the council what has happened take me too kinsman matteo said i know francisco so well that i am quite sure that of himself he will never tell the facts of this affair and will simply say that we broke out avoiding all mention of his share in it and how it was that under his orders we recaptured the other ships i think that a very good plan matteo so do you come with us and you shall tell me all about it instead of my hearing it from francis and i will take care the council know the truth of the matter the admiral got safely back i hope francis asked we saw that his galley with five others broke through the genoese fleet and got safely away but of course we knew not whether the brave admiral was himself hurt he arrived here safely polani replied but knowing the venetians as you do you will be scarcely surprised to hear that he has been sentenced to six months imprisonment for losing the battle but that is shameful francis exclaimed indignantly i heard from our captain who was present at the council that pisani was opposed to fighting and that he was only overruled by the proveditors it is shameful i will go on shore and make my report and then i will come back to you for i swear that not another blow will i strike on behalf of the republic as long as pisani is in prison it is a bad business my lad polani said but you know that pisani popular as he is with the people has few friends among the nobles they are jealous of his fame and popularity and to say the truth he has often irritated them by his bluntness and his disregard for their opinion and rank consequently they seized upon his defeat as an occasion for accusing him and it was even a question in the council of taking his life and he may be considered fortunate in getting off with the sentence of six months imprisonment i do not think he will have to remain very long in confinement we may expect the genoese fleet here in a few days for the paduan army is already moving as we heard last night no doubt it is going to cooperate with the fleet once the danger presses the populace will demand pisani's release there have already been demonstrations and shouts of viva pisani have been raised in the piazza at any rate francis let me advise you most strongly 
not to suffer any expression of your feelings concerning him to escape you before the council i need scarcely say it would do no good to the admiral and would set the whole of his enemies against you it is no affair of yours if the governors of venice behave ungratefully to one who deserves well at their hands and you have made more than enough enemies by mingling in my affairs without drawing upon yourself more foes by your championship of pisani i will of course follow your counsel francis said but i will certainly serve the state no more until pisani is freed several of the councillors were already assembled on hearing the strange news that four of the ships which had been captured by the genoese had entered port francis on announcing his errand was at once shown in to them polani accompanied him explaining his presence to the council by saying i have ventured signors to accompany my young friend here in order that i may give you a much further detail of the affair in which he has been engaged than you are likely to hear from his own lips i have just come on shore from his ship the pluto and have heard the story from my kinsman matteo giustiniani we have surely seen this young gentleman before messer polani one of the council said you have signor polani replied you may remember that he greatly distinguished himself at the fight of antium was sent home by the admiral with his dispatches and had the honor of receiving from you the thanks of the republic and the gift of citizenship i remember now the councillor said and a murmur of assent from the others showed that they also recalled the circumstance is he again the bearer of dispatches from the officer in command of the little squadron which as it seems has just by some miracle entered the port and how is it that the officer did not present himself in person before us the officer has presented himself polani said messer hammond is in command of the four ships which have just arrived not only is he in command by virtue of senior rank but it is to him that their recapture from the genoese is entirely due there was a murmur of incredulity from the circle of councillors but polani went on quietly it may seem well nigh impossible to you signors but what i say is strictly true if messer hammond will first relate to you the broad facts of the recapture of the ships i will furnish you with such details as he may omit francis then briefly related the events which had led to the capture of the four galleys he explained that by the death of the captain he as second officer succeeded to the command of the pluto and that afterwards being captured by the genoese signor parucchi the sole other surviving officer and ten gentlemen belonging to noble families and serving as volunteers on board the pluto were confined in one hold of that ship on her voyage as a prize to genoa the crew being shut up in the other that by working at night they had effected a junction with the crew and choosing a stormy night when any noise that might be made would not be heard on board the ship they made their way up to the deck above through a hole they had cut in the planks and overpowered the genoese almost without resistance that they had then in the darkness ran alongside another of the ships and captured her with equal ease and parucchi with a portion of the crew of the pluto and the venetian prisoners on board that ship had retaken a third while the pluto had captured a fourth it may seem to you signors francis concluded that we might in the same way have recaptured the rest of our ships and it was a bitter disappointment to me that we failed to do so but the storm was so high and the sea so rough that it was only with the greatest danger and difficulty that ships could lie alongside each other the bulwarks of all four vessels were greatly damaged and the pluto lost her foremast while alongside the last ship we captured and as the storm was increasing rather than abating we were to our great chagrin obliged to let the rest escape since in striving for more we might have lost not only our lives but the vessels we had taken this is indeed a most notable achievement messer hammond and the restoration of four ships and their crews at the present moment is of great importance to the republic threatened as she is with invasion by land and sea now messer polani 
if you will give us the full details of which you spoke we shall be glad polani then related to the council the full story of the means by which the crew of the pluto had gained their liberty showing how the recapture was entirely due to the initiative of francis and to the ingenuity with which he overcame all difficulties he ended by saying my kinsman matteo said that should you doubt whether this account is not tinged by his friendship and partiality for messer hammond signor parucchi and all the gentlemen who were confined with them in the hold can substantiate the account that he has given he said that parucchi's evidence would be all the more valuable since he and the other officers were in the first place much prejudiced against messer hammond deeming it an indignity that one so young and a foreigner by birth should be appointed to the command over the heads of others venetian-born of good family and his seniors in age the circumstances which i have related to you have however completely altered his opinion and he is as enthusiastic with respect to messer hammond's conduct as are my kinsmen and all on board the ship i remember now one of the council said that we had a letter from the admiral in the spring and that when describing how terribly the crews had been diminished and weakened by the severity of the winter he said that the sole exception was the pluto whose crew was kept up to their full strength and in excellent health owing entirely to the care and attention that messer hammond the officer second in command had bestowed upon them thanks messer polani the president of the council said for the light you have thrown on this matter messer hammond it is difficult to overestimate the services that you have rendered to the state we shall at an early day decide in what manner most fitly to reward them and in the meantime you will remain in command of the squadron you have brought in francis returned thanks for the promise of the president but expressed his desire to resign the command of the squadron at once i am in business he said with messer polani and although for a short time i abandoned commerce in order to sail under admiral pisani i now from various reasons desire as soon as my successor is appointed to return to my work with signor polani i desire to recommend warmly to your excellencies signor parucchi who is except myself the sole remaining officer of the pluto he seconded me most admirably in our enterprise and himself commanded at the recapture of one of the ships the gentlemen volunteers also worked with the greatest energy and spirit matteo giustiniani has been acting as third officer and to him also the thanks of the republic are due on leaving the ship messer polani had dispatched a boat to carry to his house the news that francis had returned and when they came back from the palace they found giulia anxiously expecting them and a few minutes later matteo arrived with his brother rufino and maria the latter was far more effusive in her greeting of francis than giulia had been matteo has been telling us all about it francis and that he and every one else owed their escape from the dungeons of genoa entirely to your cleverness not so much to his cleverness maria matteo corrected although he is wonderful in inventing things but to his energy determination and steadfastness there was not a one of us but regarded a visit to the dungeons of genoa as a foregone conclusion and when francis spoke of our recapturing the pluto as if it were the easiest and most natural thing in the world it was as much as we could do not to laugh in his face however he set about it as quietly and calmly as if he were carrying on the regular work of a ship we gradually caught some of his spirit and when we began to see that there was a method in his madness did our best to carry out his orders it is wonderful maria said and do you know francisco that when we first knew you after you had rescued us from the attack on the canal i absolutely thought that though you were brave and straightforward and honorable yet that by the side of our own people of your age you were rather stupid and ever since then i have been learning how mistaken i was francis laughed i think your estimate of me was correct enough he said you see people are often stupid one way and sharp another Matteo will tell you I was far behind most of those in the seminary in learning lessons, 
and certainly when it came to talking and bandying jokes i had no chance at all i suppose that every lady i have ever spoken to when i have been with you at entertainments has thought me exceptionally stupid and i am sure i am in most things only i suppose i have got a fair share of common sense and a habit of thinking for myself there was no cleverness at all in anything that matteo is telling you of it was just the same here as it was when i was in that cell near tunis i wanted to get out i supposed there must be some way out if i could but discover it and so i sat down to think how it was to be done and of course after trying in my mind every possible scheme i hit upon the right one there certainly was nothing clever in that but i have heard nothing about it yet julia said and every one else seems to know how it was done matteo do you tell julia maria ordered i have lots of questions to ask francis by the way francis messer polani said you will be glad to hear that i have succeeded in getting home your man giuseppe he returned two days ago and i have no doubt is somewhere below waiting to see you i will go and see him at once francis said hurrying away i am indeed glad to know that you have rescued him maria laughed as the door closed behind francis there rufino she said turning to him you pretend sometimes to be jealous of francisco hammond and there you see just when i have said i have lots of questions to ask him and five minutes after my arrival here to greet him he races away without a word directly he hears that his man giuseppe has returned and he is quite right maria matteo said indignantly giuseppe would give his life for francisco and the two have been together every day for the last six or seven years i don't doubt the faithful fellow is crying with joy now francisco is quite right not to keep him waiting for a minute perhaps i cried for joy too master matteo maria said i believe i did see tears in your eyes maria but i put them down to my own account you would naturally be delighted to know that your brother-in-law was safe and sound to say nothing of the fact that the family would be spared the expense of sending a thousand ducats or so to ransom him a thousand ducats matteo a thousand soldi would more nearly represent your value if the genoese did but know it but why don't you tell julia your adventures as i ordered you because julia would very much rather hear them from francisco's lips and i have no doubt he will be equally glad to tell her himself though certainly he is a bad hand at recounting his own doings however he shall have the pleasure of telling her of it and i can fill up the details for her afterwards two days later a decree was published by the council stating that in consideration of the very great service rendered to the state by francisco hammond a citizen of venice in recapturing four galleys from the genoese the council decreed the settlement upon him for life of a pension of three hundred ducats a year you will not want it francisco messer polani said as he brought in the news for i intend at the end of these troubles to take you as a partner in my business i told your father that i should do so and you have not only proved yourself earnest in business quick at learning and full of resources but you have vastly added to the debt of gratitude which first caused me to make the proposition by again saving my daughters from falling into the hands of their enemy i told your father that i should regard you in the light of a son and i do so regard you and as a son of whom i have every reason to be proud i need no thanks my lad i am still and shall always remain your debtor you have very much more than fulfilled my expectations and i shall be glad to place some of the burden of my business upon your shoulders there is another matter which i have long had in my mind but of which i will not speak just at present thus then the three hundred ducats which you will receive each year from the state may not be needed by you still you are to be congratulated upon the grant because being the recipient of a pension for distinguished services will add to your weight and influence in the city and so long as you do not need it and no man can say what may occur in the course of years to hinder the trade of venice you can bestow the sum annually upon the poor of the city and thus increase your popularity 
i shall be happy to do that signor francis said although it seems to me that popularity is of little value in venice it has not saved the man whom a short time since the people hailed as their father from unmerited disgrace and imprisonment it has not francisco but it has saved his life you may take my word for it that the proposal absolutely made in the council for the execution of pisani would have been voted had it not been for fear of the people and it may be that you will yet see that the voice of the people will bring pisani from his prison long before the expiration of his term of imprisonment popularity is not to be despised for it is a great power that power may be abused as when one having gained the ear of the people leads them astray for his own base ends and uses the popularity he has gained to attack and hurl from power men less eloquent and less gifted in the arts of cajoling the people but more worthy than himself but used rightly the power of swaying and influencing the people is a great one and especially valuable in a city like venice where private enmities and private feuds are carried to so great an extent already your name is in every mouth your rescue of pisani when sorely beset by the enemy has been the theme of talk in every house and this feat which retrieves to some extent the misfortune of pola will make your name a household word in venice immediately after the battle of pola the venetians had entered into negotiations with hungary to endeavor to detach that power from the league against them but the demands of king louis were too extravagant to be accepted he demanded the cession of trieste the recognition of the suzerainty of his crown on the part of the present doge and all his successors an annual tribute of one hundred thousand ducats and half a million of ready money this demand was so excessive that even in their distress the venetians refused to accept it and hastened on their preparations for a struggle for life or death fortunately the genoese continued for three months after their success at pola to capture the outlying possessions of venice instead of striking at the capital towards the end of july seventeen genoese vessels appeared off palestrina burned a merchant ship lying there and spent the day in reconnoitering positions and in taking soundings of the shallows and canals off brondolo they then sailed away for dalmatia in less than a week six galleys again hove in sight and admiral justiniani who was in supreme command of the forces issued out from the lido with an equal number of ships to give them battle on his way however a black object was seen in the water as they neared it this was seen to be the head of a swimmer he was soon picked up and was found to be a venetian citizen named savadia who had been captured by the enemy but had managed to escape and was swimming towards land to warn his countrymen that the whole genoese fleet of forty-seven sail under pietro doria was close at hand and that the six ships in the offing were simply a decoy to tempt the venetians to come out and give battle giustiniani at once returned to port and scarcely had he done so than the whole genoese fleet made its appearance they approached the passage of the lido but the respite that had been afforded them had enabled the venetians to make their preparations and the genoese found to their disappointment that the channels of the lido and malamocco were completely closed up with sunken vessels palisades and chains and they sailed away to seek another entry through which they could strike at venice had the same precautions that had proved so effective at the lido and malamocco passages been taken at all the other channels venice could have defied all the efforts of doria's fleet the city is situated on a group of small islands rising in the midst of a shallow basin twenty-five miles long and five wide and separated from the sea by a long sand bank formed by the sediment brought down by the rivers piave and adige through this sand bank the sea had pierced several channels treporti the northern of these channels contained water only for the smallest craft the next opening was known as the port of lido and separated the island of san nicolo from malamocco 
five miles farther on is the passage of malamoco between that island and pelestrina southwest of pelestrina lay brondolo behind which stood chioggia twenty miles distant from venice the southern point of brondolo was only separated by a small channel called the canal of lombardy from the mainland unfortunately at brondolo the channel had not been closed all preparations had been made for doing so but the work had been postponed until the last moment in order that trading vessels might enter and leave the harbor the Kyogians, believing that there was sure to be sufficient warning of the approach of an enemy to enable them to close the entrance in time the sudden appearance of doria's fleet before brondolo upset all these calculations and the genoese easily carried the position little chioggia the portion of the town separated from the rest by the canal of santa caterina was captured without difficulty but the bridge across the canal was strongly defended by bastions and redoubts and here pietro emo made a brave stand with his garrison of three thousand five hundred men the enemy at once erected his batteries and on the twelfth of august the genoese opened fire the venetians replied stoutly and for three days a heavy cannonade was kept up on both sides reinforcements had reached the garrison from venice and hour by hour swift boats brought the news to the city of the progress of the fight so far all seemed going on well the genoese had suffered heavily and made no impression upon the batteries at the head of the bridge the days passed in venice in a state of restless disquietude it was hoped and believed that chioggia could successfully defend itself but if it fell the consequence would be terrible already the hungarians had overrun the venetian possessions on the mainland the lord of padua was in the field with his army and communication was cut with ferrara their sole ally should chioggia fall the genoese fleet would enter the lagoons and would sail by the great channel through the flats from chioggia to venice and their light galleys could overrun the whole of the lagoons and cut off all communication with the mainland and starvation would rapidly stare the city in the face Polani made all preparations for the worst many of his valuables were hidden away in recesses beneath the floors others were taken on board one of his ships in the port and this was held in readiness to convey julia and maria whose husband had willingly accepted polani's offer to endeavor to carry her off by sea with julia in case the genoese should enter the city the merchant made an excursion to chioggia with francis to see for himself how things were going and returned somewhat reassured francis spent much of his time at the port visiting polani's ships talking to the sailors and expressing to them his opinion that the genoese and paduans would never have dared to lay siege to chioggia had they not known that pisani was no longer in command of the venetian forces i regard the present state of affairs he said over and over again as a judgment upon the city for its base ingratitude to the brave admiral and i am convinced that things will never come right until we have him again in command of our fleet giustiniani is no doubt an able man but what has he ever done in comparison to what pisani has accomplished why should we place our only hope of safety in the hands of an untried man i warrant if pisani was out and about you would see venice as active as a swarm of bees pouring out against our aggressors what is being done now preparations are being made but of what kind ships are sunk in the channel but what will be the use of this if chioggia falls the canals to that place will be blocked but that will not prevent the genoese from passing in their light boats from island to island until they enter venice itself do you think all these ships would be lying idly here if pisani were in command talk to your comrades talk to the sailors in the port talk to those on shore when you land and urge everywhere that the cry should be raised for pisani's release and restoration to command End of chapter 17 Recording by Linda Johnson
Chapter 18 of The Lion of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 18 The Release of Pisani. On the morning of the 17th, the party were sitting at breakfast when Julia suddenly sprang to her feet. Listen, she exclaimed. Her father and Francis looked at her in surprise, but instinctively listened for whatever sound she could have heard. Then a deep, solemn sound boomed through the air. It is the bell of the campanile tolling, the merchant exclaimed. It is the signal for all citizens to take up arms. Some terrible news has arrived. Hastily putting on his armor, the merchant started to St. Mark's, accompanied by Francis, who put on a steel cap, which he preferred to the heavy helmet, and a breastplate. A crowd of citizens were pursuing the same direction. The numbers thickened as they approached the piazza, which they found on their arrival to be already thronged with people, who were densely packed in front of the palace, awaiting an explanation of the summons. There was a look of deep anxiety on every face, for all felt that the news must be bad indeed which could have necessitated such a call. Presently the doge, accompanied by the council, appeared in the balcony. A complete silence fell upon the multitude. The bell ceased tolling, and not the slightest sound disturbed the stillness. One of the councillors stepped to the front, for the doge contarini was now seventy-two years old and his voice could hardly have been heard over so wide an area citizens of the republic gather i pray you all your fortitude and constancy to hear the news which i have to tell it is bad news but there is no reason for repining still less for despair if venice has but confidence in herself such as she has throughout her history shown when danger seemed imminent be assured that we shall weather this storm as we have done all that have preceded it chioggia has fallen an exclamation of pain and grief went up from the crowd the speaker held up his hand for silence chioggia contrary to our hopes and expectations has fallen but we are proud to say it has fallen from no lack of bravery on the part of its defenders as you know for six days the brave podesta emo and his troops have repulsed every attack but yesterday an unforeseen accident occurred while our soldiers were holding their own as usual a genoese fire-ship exploded in the canal behind them the idea unfortunately seized the troops that the bridge was on fire the genoese shouted the bridge is in flames and pressed onward and our soldiers fell back in some confusion towards the bridge here emo with four brave companions made a noble stand and for a time checked the advance of the foe but he was driven back there was no time to destroy the communication behind him the enemy pressed on and mingled with our retreating soldiers entered the town and so chioggia was taken our loss in killed is said to be eight hundred and sixty men, while the rest of the garrison, four thousand in number, were taken prisoners. A loud cry of anguish burst from the crowd. Numbers of those present had relatives and friends among the garrison of Chioggia, and to all the news of this terrible disaster was a profound blow. Venice was open now to invasion. In a few hours, the enemy might appear in her canals. The council and the nobles endeavored to dispel the feeling of despair. While some harangued the people from the balconies, others went down and mingled with the crowd, assuring them that all was not yet lost, that already messengers had been dispatched to Doria and the lord of Padua, asking for terms of peace, and even should these be refused, venice might yet defend herself until zeno arrived with his fleet to their rescue the doge himself received deputations of the citizens and by his calmness and serenity did much to allay the first feeling of terror and dismay and in a few hours the city recovered its wonted aspect of tranquillity the next morning the answer to the overtures was received 
the lord of padua who was doubtless beginning to feel some misgivings as to the final issue of the struggle declared that he himself was not unwilling to treat upon certain terms but that the decision must rest in the hands of his colleague doria believing that venice was now in his grasp rejected the idea of terms with scorn by god's faith my lords of venice he cried ye shall have no peace from the lord of padua nor from our commune of genoa until i have put a bit in the mouths of the horses of your evangelist of saint mark when they have been bridled you shall then in sooth have a good peace and this is our purpose and that of our commune as for these captives my brethren he said pointing to some genoese prisoners of rank whom the venetians had sent with their embassy in hopes of conciliating the genoese take them back i want them not for in a few days i am coming to release from your prisons them and the rest as soon as the message was received the bell summoned the popular assembly together and in the name of the doge pietro mocenigo described to them the terrible nature of the peril that threatened them told them that after the insolent reply of doria there was now no hope save in their own exertions and invited all to rally round the national standard for the protection of their hearths and homes the reply of the assembly was unanimous and shouts were raised let us arm ourselves let us equip and man what galleys are in the arsenal let us sally out to the combat it is better to die in the defence of our country than to perish here from want a universal conscription was at once ordered new taxes were imposed and the salaries of the magistrates and civil functionaries suspended all business came to a standstill and property fell to a fourth of its former value the imposts were not found adequate to produce the sums required and a new loan at five per cent was decreed all subscribed to the utmost of their ability raising the enormous sum of six million two hundred ninety four thousand and forty lire a new captain-general was elected and the government nominated taddeo giustiniani to the post the fortification of the city with earthworks was commenced lines of defence were drawn from lido to san spirito and two wooden towers constructed at the former point to guard the pass of san nicolo events succeeded each other with the greatest rapidity and all these matters were settled within thirty-six hours of the fall of chioggia in all respects the people at first yielded implicit obedience to the order of the council they enrolled themselves for service they subscribed to the loan they labored at the outworks but from the moment the appointment of taddeo giustiniani was announced they grew sullen it was not that they objected to the new captain-general who was a popular nobleman but every man felt that something more than this was required in such an emergency and that the best man that venice could produce should be at the helm the sailors of the port were the first to move in the matter and shouts for vettore pisani were heard in the streets others took up the cry and soon a large multitude assembled in the piazza and with menacing shouts demanded that pisani should be freed and appointed so serious did the tumult become that the council were summoned in haste pisani so popular with the lower class that they called him their father was viewed with corresponding dislike and distrust by the nobles who were at once jealous of his fame and superiority and were alarmed at a popularity which could have made him had he chosen it the master of the state it was not therefore until after some hours of stormy debate that they decided to give in to the wishes of the crowd which was continually growing larger and more threatening and it was late in the evening before the senators deputed by the council followed by the exulting populace hurried to the prison to apprise pisani that he was free and that the doge and senate were expecting him pisani heard the message without emotion and placidly replied that he should prefer to pass the night where he was in reflection and would wait on the signori in the morning at daybreak on friday the nineteenth of august the senatorial delegates and the people accompanied by the other officers who had been involved in the disgrace of pisani 
and who had now been freed reappeared at the gates of the prison these were immediately opened and pisani appeared with his usual expression of cheerfulness and good humor on his face he was at once lifted on to the shoulders of some sailors and borne in triumph to the palace amid the deafening cheers of the populace on the staircase he was met by the doge and senators who saluted him cordially mass was heard in the chapel and pisani and the council then set to business and were for some time closeted together the crowd waited outside the building continuing to shout and when pisani issued out from the palace he was seized and carried in triumph to his house in san fantino as he was passing the campanile of saint mark his old pilot marino corbaro a remarkably able seaman but a perpetual grumbler against those in authority met him and elbowing his way through the crowd drew close to him loudly shouting at the same time now is the time admiral for revenging yourself by seizing the dictatorship of this city behold all are at your service all are willing at this very instant to proclaim you prince if you choose the loyalty of pisani's nature was so affronted by this offer that in a fury of rage he leaned forward and struck corbaro a heavy blow with his fist and then raising his voice shouted to those about him let none who wish me well say viva pisani but viva san marco and the populace then shouted viva san marco and our father pisani no sooner had pisani reached his house than the news was bruited about that the admiral had been merely appointed governor of lido and that Justiniani remained in command of the navy. The people were furious, and a deputation of six hundred waited upon Pisani and said, We are yours, command us as you will. Pisani told them that it was for the Republic and not for him to command their services. The deputation then went to the council and declared, in the name of fifty thousand Venetians, that not a man would embark on the galleys until pisani received his command as captain-general of all the forces of the republic by land and sea the council of ten finding it impossible to resist the popular demand and terrified at the idea of the tumult that a refusal would arouse at last agreed to their request fortunately for the republic the four days which elapsed between the fall of chioggia and the appointment of pisani to the supreme command had not been utilized by the enemy carrara and doria had always been at variance as to their plans of operations and as usual they differed now the lord of padua urged the necessity for following up their success by an instant attack upon venice while doria insisted upon carrying out his original plan and trusting as much to starvation as to military operations he however gradually pushed forward two outposts at poreja and malamoco and on the latter island at a distance of three miles from venice he erected a battery many of whose shot fell at san spirito francis had borne his share in the events which had led to the installation of pisani in the supreme command he had at first instigated the sailors of polani to raise a cry in the streets for the restoration of the admiral and had gone about with two or three of his friends mingling with knots of persons and urging that the only hope of the republic lay in the energy and talent of pisani even matteo had joined him although taddeo giustiniani was his own uncle but as the lad said what matters it about relationship now what will become of relationship if the genoese and paduans land here raise the city to the ground and scatter us over the face of the earth no when it comes to a question of ordinary command of course i should go with my family but when venice is in danger and only one man can save her i should vote for him whoever the other may be polani had also exerted the great influence he possessed among the commercial classes and had aided the efforts of francis by giving leave to the sailors of all his ships in port to go on shore a few hours after pisani's release 
the merchant accompanied by francis called upon him welcome my friends he said heartily well you see messer hammond that i was a true prophet and that i have had my share of the dungeon however we need not talk of that now i am up to my eyes in business i have no doubt of that admiral polani said i have called to offer every ship i have in the harbour for the defence of the city i myself will continue to pay their crews as at present use the vessels as you like make fire-ships of them if you will i can afford the loss thanks my friend the admiral said we shall find a use for them never fear as for you messer hammond even in my prison i heard of your gallant feat in recapturing the pluto and three other ships from the genoese and thus retrieving to some extent the losses of pola i hope to wipe off the rest of the score before long i shall find a command for you in a day or two age and rank go for nothing now i am going to put the best men in the best position i have just appointed that old rascal corbaro vice-admiral of the lido he is a grumbling old scoundrel and would have had me get up a revolution to-day for which i had to knock him down but he is one of the best sailors venice ever turned out and just the man for the place i would rather act as a general aide-de-camp to you admiral than have a separate command if you will allow me francis said i am still too young to command and should be thwarted by rivalry and jealousies i would therefore far rather act under your immediate orders if you will allow me so be it then lad come to me to-morrow and i have no doubt i shall have plenty for you to do at present i cannot say what course i may adopt for in truth i don't know what position i shall hold the people do not seem content with my having only the government of lido but for myself i care nothing whether i hold that command or that of captain-general it is all one to me so that i can serve the republic and giustiniani is an able man and will no doubt do his business well you do not think so young man he broke off when francis shook his head i do not indeed sir he has erected two wooden towers at the mouth of the lido which the first stone from a genoese ballista would knock to splinters and has put up a fence to san spirito which a genoese soldier in full armor could jump over well we shall see messer hammond the admiral said smiling i fear you have one bad quality among your many good ones and that is that you are a partisan but go along now i have no more time to spare to you no sooner had pisani obtained the supreme command than he set to work in earnest to provide for the safety of the city the reorganization of the navy and the conversion of the new levies into soldiers and sailors the hulls of forty galleys which were lying in the arsenals were taken in hand and two-thirds of them were equipped and ready for sea in three days the population was full of ardor and enthusiasm and crowded to the offices to register their names for service the women brought their jewels to be melted down into money and all vied with each other in zeal pisani's first task after seeing the galleys put in hand was to examine the defences giustiniani had erected he at once pronounced the two wooden towers of which francis had spoken so disrespectfully to be utterly useless and ordered two tall towers of solid masonry to be erected in their stead giustiniani was indignant at this condemnation of his work and he and his friends so worked upon the minds of those who were to carry out the work that they laid down their tools and refused to embark upon such useless operations the news was brought to pisani by one of his friends and starting in his gondola he was soon upon the spot he wasted no time in remonstrating with the workmen on their conduct but seizing a trowel lifted a heavy stone into its place shouting let him who loves st mark follow my example the success of the appeal was instantaneous the workmen grasped their tools a host of volunteers seized the stones and carried them to their places when they were exhausted fresh workmen took their places and in the incredibly short time of four days the two castles were finished 
the workmen were next set to level the paling and earthwork from lido to san spirito and in the course of a fortnight the lofty and massive stone walls were erected by this time something like a fleet was at pisani's disposal in spite of the conduct of taddeo giustiniani pisani with his usual magnanimity gave him the command of three large ships mounting the heaviest guns in the arsenal the light boats were under the command of giovanni barberigo federigo cornaro was stationed with a force of galleys at san spirito nicolo galeano was charged with the defense of the lazaretto san clemente santa elena and the neighborhood while on the strand between lido and malamoco behind the main wall were the mercenaries eight thousand strong under jacopo cavalli heavy booms were placed across all the canals by which it was likely that the enemy's fleet might advance francis found his office under the energetic admiral no sinecure he was kept constantly moving from one point to the other to see that all was going on well and to report the progress made the work never ceased night or day and for the first week neither francis nor his commander ever went to bed contenting themselves with such chance sleep as they could snatch having wasted eight precious days the enemy on the twenty fourth of august advanced to the attack a genoese force under doria's brother landed upon san nicolo while the paduans attacked san spirito and santa marta they found the besieged in readiness directly the alarm was given the venetians flocked to the threatened points and repulsed the enemy with slaughter the latter then attempted to make a junction of their forces but cornaro with his galleys occupied the canal drove back the boats in which they intended to cross and defeated the attempt doria had felt certain that the movement which was attempted under cover of night would succeed and his disappointment was extreme the lord of padua was so disgusted that he withdrew his troops to the mainland doria remained before venice until the early part of october but without making another attack indeed the defences had long before become so formidable that attack was well-nigh hopeless at the end of that time he destroyed all his works and fell back upon chioggia and determined to wait there until venice was starved into surrender the suffering in the city was intense it was cut off from all access to the mainland behind but occasionally a ship laden with provisions from egypt or syria managed to evade the genoese galleys these precarious supplies however availed but little for the wants of the starving city eked out though they were by the exertions of the sailors who occasionally sailed across the lagoon landed on the mainland and cut off the supplies sent from padua and elsewhere to the genoese camp the price of provisions was so enormous that the bulk of the people were famishing and even in the houses of the wealthy the pressure was great the nobility however did their utmost for their starving countrymen and the words of pietro mocenigo speaking in the name of the doge to the popular assembly were literally carried into effect let all he said who are pressed by hunger go to the dwellings of the patricians there you will find friends and brothers who will divide with you their last crust so desperate indeed did the position become that a motion was made by some members of the council for emigrating from the lagoons and founding a new home in candia or negroponte but this proposal was at once negatived and the venetians declared that sooner than abandon their city they would bury themselves under her ruins so october and november passed carlo zeno had not yet arrived but by some letters which had been captured with a convoy of provisions it was learned that he had been achieving the most triumphant success had swept the seas from genoa to constantinople had captured a genoese galleon valued at three hundred thousand ducats and was at candia this intelligence revived the hopes of venice and on the sixteenth of november luigi morocchini was dispatched to order him in the name of the government peremptorily to hasten to the rescue of venice almost at the same time 
Giovanni Barberigo, with his light craft, surprised and captured three of the enemy's vessels, killing many of the sailors and taking a hundred and fifty prisoners. The success was not in itself important, but it raised the hopes of the Venetians as being the first time they had taken the offensive. Pisani himself had endeavored to reconnoiter the position of the enemy, but had each time been sharply repulsed, losing ten boats and thirty men upon one occasion, when the doge's nephew, Antonio Gradenigo, was also killed by the enemy. But in spite of this, he advised government to make a great effort to recover Chioggia. He admitted that the chances of failure were great. Still, he maintained that success was possible, and it was better that the Venetians should die fighting than by hunger. As the result of his expeditions, he had found that Doria had at least 30,000 men, 50 great ships, and from seven to eight hundred light craft. Moreover, his troops were in high spirits, well fed and well cared for, and should therefore be man to man more than a match for the starving soldiers of Venice. Nevertheless, there was a possibility of success, as Zeno would doubtless arrive by the time the siege had fairly commenced. After much debate, the council determined that the undertaking should be attempted. To stir the people to the utmost exertion, the Senate, on the 1st of December, published a decree that the thirty plebeians who should most liberally meet the urgent necessities of the state by the proffer of their persons or estates should, after peace was made, be raised to the rank of nobility and summoned to the great council, that thirty-five thousand ducats of gold should be distributed annually among those who were not elected, and their heirs forever that any foreign merchant who should display peculiar zeal for the cause of the republic should be admitted to the full privileges of citizenship and that on the other hand such venetians as might endeavour to elude a participation in the common burdens and hardships should be held by so doing to have forfeited all their civil rights seventy-five candidates came forward some offered money some personal service or the service of their sons and relatives some presented galleys and offered to pay their crews immense efforts were made and by the twenty first of december sixty ships four hundred boats of all sizes and thirty-four war galleys were equipped the doge although just seventy-three years old signified his wish to assume the supreme command of the expedition pisani acting as his lieutenant and admiral during the long weeks the siege continued francis saw little of the polanis his duties keeping him constantly near pisani with whom he took such meals as the time would afford sleeping in his house in readiness for instant service maria had returned to her father's house for her husband was in command of the outpost nearest to the enemy and was therefore constantly away from home maria's spirits were higher than ever she made light of the hardships in the way of food bantered francis when he came on his business engagements and affected to treat him with extreme respect as the trusted lieutenant of pisani julia too kept up her spirits and no one would have thought listening to the lively talk of the two girls with their father and francis that venice was besieged by an overwhelming force and reduced to the direst straits by hunger the greater part of Polani's ships were now in the service of the state. Those which remained were constantly engaged in running across to the Dalmatian coast and bringing in cargoes of provisions through the cordon of the Genoese galleys. The light gondola, which, after being repaired, had been lying for two years under cover in Messer Polani's yard, had again been made useful. Giuseppe had returned to his old work, and he and another powerful oarsman made the light boat fly through the water as francis carried the orders of the admiral to the various posts he had also been in it upon several of the reconnoitring expeditions in the canals leading to chioggia and although hotly chased he had on each occasion left his pursuers behind the evening before the expedition was to start pisani said to him 
i think you have brought me more news with that fast little craft of yours than i have been able to obtain even at the cost of some hard fighting and a good many lives i wish that you would make an excursion for me to-night and find out if you can whether the enemy have moved their position since the last time i reconnoitred them i particularly wish to learn if they have strong forces near the outlets of the channels of chioggia and brondolo and the canal of lombardy you know my plans and with such a host of recruits as i shall have with me it is all important that there should be no failure at first veterans can stand defeat but a reverse is fatal to young troops heaven knows they will have enough to bear with wet cold exposure and hunger and success will be necessary to keep up their spirits do not push your adventure too far run no risk if you can help it i would not for much that harm befell you francis at once accepted the commission and left the admiral in order to make his preparations giuseppe he said as he took his place in the boat i want you to find for me for service to-night a gondolier who is a native of chioggia and who knows every foot of the country round and every winding of the canals he must be intelligent and brave for the risk will be no slight one i think i know such a man messer francisco but if he happens to be away there will be no difficulty in finding another for there are many fishermen here who escaped before the genoese captured chioggia when will you see him as soon as you have landed me at messer polani's go and fetch him giuseppe and if you can find one or two old fishermen of chioggia bring them also with you i want to gain as much information as possible regarding the country is it true that the fleet starts to-morrow francisco maria asked as he entered every one says so it is quite true there will be no further change the orders have been all issued and you may rely upon it that we are going to sea and when will you return that's another matter altogether francis laughed it may be a week it may be three months but i thought we were going to fight the genoese galleys it does not seem to me that a week is wanted to do that a day to go to chioggia a day to fight and a day to return what can you want more than that for i do not think that we are going to fight the genoese galleys francis answered certainly we shall not do so if we can help it they are vastly stronger than we are but i do not know that we need fear them for all that what do you mean francisco you do not mean to fight they are vastly stronger than you are and yet you do not fear them you are not given to speak in riddles but you have puzzled me this time well i will explain myself a little francis said but you must remember that it is a secret and not to be whispered to any one that is right maria said i love a secret especially a state secret julia come and sit quite close so that he can whisper it into our ears and even the walls shall not hear it now sir explain yourself i will explain it without telling you francis said have you not gone to see african lions who were very much stronger and fiercer than yourself and yet you did not fear them because they have been in cages maria said but what has that to do with it it explains the whole matter francis said we do not mean to fight the genoese fleet if we can help it but we are going to try to put them in a cage and then we shall not be afraid of them do not trifle with us sir maria said sternly how can you put genoese galleys in a cage we cannot put them in a cage but we can cage them up francis said pisani's intention is if possible to close all the entrances to the canals round chioggia thus not only will the genoese galleys be unable to sally out to attack us but the whole of the genoese army will be cooped up and we shall then do to them what they have been doing to us namely starve them out capital capital maria said clapping her hands your pisani is a grand man francisco and if he can do this for us there is nothing which we would not do to show our gratitude but you won't find it easy besides in the game of starving out are we likely to win the contest will not be even for they start on it full men and strong while our people are half starved already i do not regard success as certain francis replied 
and pisani himself acknowledges the chances are very great against us still it is possible and as nothing else seems possible we are going to attempt it polani looked grave when he heard of the mission which francis was going to undertake julia's bright color fled at once and maria said angrily you have no right to be always running into danger francisco you are not a venetian and there is no reason why you should be always running risks greater than those which most venetians are likely to encounter you ought to think of us who care for you if you don't choose to think of yourself i did not volunteer for the service francis said i was asked by the admiral to undertake it and even had i wished it i could hardly have refused the admiral selected me not from any merit on my part but because he knows that my boat is one of the fastest on the lagoons and that i can easily run away from any of the genoese rowboats he particularly ordered me to run no unnecessary risks that is all very well maria said but you know very well that you will run risks and put yourself in the way of danger if there is a chance of doing so you should tell him not to go father i cannot do that maria for the service he has undertaken is a very important one to venice everything depends upon the success of pisani's attempt and undertaken as it is against great odds it is of the utmost importance that there should be no mistake as to the position of the enemy whether francis was wise or not in accepting pisani's offer that he should act as his aide-de-camp may be doubted but now that he has undertaken it he must carry out his orders especially as it is now too late to make other arrangements did he draw back if you will come into my room francisco i will give you a chart of the passages around chioggia you can study that and you will then the better understand the information you may receive from the men you are expecting half an hour later giuseppe arrived with the gondolier he had spoken of and two old fishermen and from their explanations and a study of the map francis gained an exact idea of the localities from his previous expeditions he had learned where the genoese were generally posted and something of the strength of the forces at the various points in truth they kept but a careless watch feeling convinced that the venetians possessed no forces capable of attacking him and that their surrender must now be a matter of a few days only doria took no precautions his troops were all quartered in the houses of chioggia his galleys moored alongside its quays and the utmost he did was to post small bodies of men with rowboats at the entrances to the passages from the sea and up the lagoons to give warning of any sudden attempt on the part of barberigo with his light flotilla to make a dash at the galleys and endeavor to burn them having obtained all the information he could from the old fishermen francis dismissed them it is evident he said to giuseppe that we can hardly hope to succeed in passing the boats at the entrance to the canal seaward or by going up the lagoon the only plan that i can see is for us to land on the island of palestrina which is held by us to carry the boat across it and to embark in the malamocco channel in this way we should be within their cordon of boats and can row fearlessly either out to the entrances or to chioggia itself we are not likely to be detected and if we are we must make a race of it to palestrina the gondolier agreed that the scheme was practicable and francis ordered giuseppe and him to remove the burdens and every bit of wood that could be dispensed with from the gondola so as to facilitate its transport end of chapter eighteen recording by linda johnson